Here, um, I'm Lisa Hunter, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the director of the Institute for Scientists and Engineering Educators. And so this, um, this first seminar in this series is a little bit different because we're, we're going to have four speakers, and so they're all going to be on a very focused topic. But I thought I would start us off to kind of uh, help zoom into that topic so they can just jump right in. Um, we're working with, uh, on a, uh, this new HHMI project, we're one of the partners on it, and are supporting it in kind of a unique way, and I think that will, um, That'll also become clear as we um, as we move into the speakers. And so today is really about something that I think a lot of we, we hear a lot about. Some of the really tough challenges in teaching. There's lots of challenges, but um, a lot of people, um, you know, it's, we've been talking with professors who want to transform courses and, and the, what are really big priorities. And, and we hear this, and I hear this a lot uh, around the country as well. That students lack problem-solving skills. I'd like for them to be better able to understand how to really do science. What does it mean to do science? Um, and how do students that often don't know how to explain phenomena and want students to, um, again, be able to just do the processes of science. And that this is a really challenging thing to teach, and I think we all sort of want it and get, can get behind that, but then how do you actually teach that? And so today's um, speakers are all going to address that and how we do that within our program. Um, at the heart of the Institute for Scientists and Engineer Educators is a program, the Professional Development Program, and we've been running this for a long time, uh, 15 years now. Uh, it was uh, it started as the Center for Adaptive Optics, so people didn't know about it for a long time because we served a different audience, and as we became icy, then it became open more and more to the um, campus community. And so it includes um, workshops, coaching, and a practical teaching experience. It's primarily for graduate students and postdocs. And um, we focus on a lot of different things, um, all building on the, the research around uh, teaching and learning and equity and inclusion. Um, but, and, and the participants gain a, a whole lot of different teaching strategies and real practical experience with it. But today, um, really briefly, we're gonna tell you about a particular aspect of the program, and that is um, teaching uh, scientific practices. So things, like I say, this idea of critical thinking, um, reasoning skills, how to think like a scientist. The way that our program works is we have these sort of two strands that are integrated. And so the graduate students and postdocs do our program. They design and then pilot a, a laboratory unit in one of our programs. And so they're going through in this uh, horizontal strand, developing their professional skills, teaching, but other professional skills advance in their careers, but when they try out their teaching, they're, they're doing it um, in our programs and are aimed at undergraduates. So all that's going on simultaneously, and so the speakers that follow me are going to tell you about um, a, a little bit about what they did here in this middle part where they were piloting their teaching activity. Um, something that's different that came with the uh, HHMI grant is that we are um, just, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years, but the new component is that what gets taught um, in, in these uh, piloting venues, then we'll feed into the transformed classes that we're looking on with the HHMI project. And so that's something newer that we're doing this year, and it's, it's really nice that uh, this came along with the grant. But again, we're gonna really zoom in on a, on a specific aspect, this idea of doing science. And so each of the presenters then are going to tell you about how they approach that, uh, get really specific uh, about what it means to do science and some of the skills there. And uh, what we hope is that others of you that are interested in uh, this idea of teaching scientific practices in your classes, what, um, what you might, what they learned and what could share with you in terms of how to teach it and how to assess it. So with that, I think that is all for me. And I'm going to turn over the floor to the first speaker, who is now I've got these. Great. Okay. So, oh, okay. Matt Regal is the first one, and Matt is a graduate <coughs> student in um, MCD biology here, and uh, this is his his team then taught, and he this is his second time through the program. <coughs>
first, I want to say thank you to Lisa and uh, all of the ICPDP people for organizing this and for uh, Tisha and Nina. I mean, you guys are really facilitating this, these meetings and everybody else involved. Um, so anyway, today I'm going to talk about um, basically model building, so constructing and then also revising models um, while learning about gene expression regulation. So it's clear to a biology person. Um, so often, um, scientists are faced with a struggle uh, to connect two different ideas. So say in this example of external stimulus and then an internal gene expression change. Um, they're left kind of this black box. And so what they do is they initially begin to develop uh, hypotheses that might explain the connection between these two things. So in this you know, example of external stimulus is cause cause of event A and then event B and then leads to the resulting expression change. Um, and this supposes how this happens. It's based on a general model. Um, and so what we did in our activity was we presented six different starters um, in which the students uh, could choose and then begin to ask questions uh, to follow up and begin to develop hypotheses that would sort of uh, at least begin to explain a phenomenon. So here's an example where uh, this yeast candida albicans uh, in which in presence of a pheromone, um, there's a resulting gene expression change inside the cell uh, that leads to mating of two different types. Uh, in the absence of this pheromone, uh, there is a different gene expression network that's activated, and this leads to biofilm formation, uh, which can be very detrimental in uh, medical situations, say with the catheters and implants and things like that, and very deadly actually. Um, so we wanted to take the students through hypothesis making initially um, in this step here. Um, so we asked them to hypothesize about the connection. Um, they had about 30 minutes to design, diagram, and just present basically their initial hypothesis. So I just want to highlight really quickly the difference between say, a hypothesis and a model. But a hypothesis is a supposition or proposed uh, explanation made on limited evidence, uh, whereas a model is to make a particular feature of the world easier to understand based upon uh, existing commonly accepted knowledge. So in, that, in other words, you're collecting evidence to support that model. And so we got them first to that point where they're constructing a hypothesis, uh, and then we wanted to get them to the point where they can develop and revise models at that point. So um, we actually took uh, something from what I learned in one of our institutes um, that was piloted by uh, someone here. Um, and we, we took the groups and we split them up into individuals and had them go through these short courses in which they learned about one particular component uh, that might be related to what they're interested in understanding. So three different groups here, or three different individuals of the group. Um, and so one example here is that if there are a set of proteins and a DNA sequence, um, they have the opportunity to then mutate, delete, add different nucleotide sequences, and then look at uh, the change in affinity of a protein for that particular sequence. So through this, we're hoping to get them the idea that there's specificity of different proteins for particular small sequences. Uh, and then we have a couple different variations on that for other ideas. Then they would take this knowledge, and they would return back to their research group with this information. And so first they developed a hypothesis, they went through the research groups, the short courses, developed a foundational knowledge, <coughs> and then they uh, developed a model off of that. Then we took it a little bit further to go into the revisement phase, and we wanted them to incorporate evidence into their hypothesis to begin to make it a true model. And so, for example, one idea would be a gene expression inhibitor binds to the DNA in the region of the mating gene give them that tidbit of information and say, how do you revise your model now? So we did that iterative process to help them make a better and better and better model based upon evidence. And so this is a real, this is an authentic thing. You, know, you go to a conference, you see a talk, you take the tidbits of information home and apply it to your project, paper, that sort of thing. So where we hope to get them with their learning content is somewhere in the idea of this. Gene expression regulation is connected to the extracellular environment through interactions between distinct sequences in a promoter of a gene, and uh, transcriptional activators or repressors, proteins that will bind to that. That was kind of our, our learning content. And I would say, just guessing that maybe 90% of our students got to that point, but what's nice is that 100% of our students got to go through the process of building models and revising models. So they got that process, and I think that's what a lot of people are looking for in education these days, is doing something. So the benefits of this, um, students allow themselves to explore ideas first without supporting evidence, developing hypotheses. Um, and students own the knowledge. 
they acquire in those research groups. So they have more motivation, um, and they feel like they're actually being a scientist, you know, coming back with some, some knowledge. Um, and then students incorporate evidence to refine their model, which is really, really important. Um, we're always looking for evidence-based models. Um, and then students had the opportunity to compare and contrast different models. Um, so they got to the point where they had a good model and they were comfortable with it, we asked them to build another model that might just equally um, explain the phenomenon. So how do you take something like this and you know, design it into a, a particular course? A couple of ideas, um, allow the students to develop ideas without any supporting evidence. Um, let them acquire evidence to turn a hypothesis into a model. Uh, so these are very student-driven sort of ideas. Um, and then let them compare and contrast models and then discuss and devise a consensus model. So the one-on-one -on -one lecture to student you know, knowledge transfer doesn't necessarily allow a lot of this. So it's important to somehow figure out ways, um, perhaps you know, along the lines of how we've done it, to incorporate that into uh, education. So I think that's that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there any part of this? I, I didn't. Maybe I missed it. That. Um, where you ask them to design an experiment to test some critical difference between two models, let's say, that are competing with each other. Yeah, so uh, a lot of these students are just beginning sort of their upper division. So, it would, well, actually, they would still kind of be in lower division, so it would be intra-bio. So the ability to do that, I think, might be a struggle for some of these students. But that said, I, I wouldn't stop, I wouldn't hesitate from I can't say we did that explicitly, but it probably came through in some of our discussions with the groups. So with the facilitation, we walk around, we watch what they're drawing, we listen to what they're saying, and from there we can ask questions like that and say, how would you test that? How do you know that? You know, can you verify or compare? So. Just a couple of practical questions. Like, how big are the groups and dealing and how do you um, assess their participation? It's a good question, yeah. So assessment is a big part of the IC program, the PDP. Um, so to assess them in the end, um, so that's some of the assessment, um, we had to do a jigsaw, so we broke the groups up again. Each individual was responsible for being able to explain the process that they went through. We brought all the group, you know, individuals of groups together and then we shared with each other. So you can kind of see what they're saying at that point. Um, and then in addition to that, you can also kind of just listen to what they're saying, watch what they're drawing kind of know that they're on the right track. And as far as your first question, um, the groups were groups of three, and we had 18 students, actually in this room. Um, and um, I feel like it could be scaled up because there were times when we kind of were sort of hanging back, you know, we, we checked in with the group and then we had a little time. So for this, these activities specifically, this one, you know, I, I would be comfortable taking it up to maybe 40 or so. Uh, but yeah, tweaking maybe could be um, how many times did the class meet, and what level were the students at? And then, I mean, if you have to assign a grade to oh, students, yeah. they're, especially at intro levels, they're not going to like it if you just say, well, we'll see what you say at the end. Right. So we had, uh, we designed a question, well, not, not really a questionnaire, but it was something that we filled out as we were listening to what they were saying in the jigsaw. Um, and so it was particular points, like, you know, did, did they, you know, we ask them a question to prompt, basically. And we say, you know, give them the prompt and then see how they respond to the ask. It's almost like a really informal, more comfortable oral exam, really, um, where it's not necessarily directed at them because they're just sharing with the rest of the group, you know. Um, so if you were, if I was going to assign a grade to this activity specifically, I would say probably off of what we're jotting down on those, you know, we have a list of six or seven questions. And then we have a primary question, which is our, our learning goal that I, that I explained there. Do they get to that point, and how close do they get? Do they say the ones? And how many? How I mean, what this level? is a very specific topic. So I mean, was this a quarter-long kind of course? No, it was just a day. It was one day. Just a day, yeah. And so we struggled a little bit with that when we were designing because it is a very broad topic. I mean, you're talking, you know, we're talking about receptors getting a signal on the outside of a cell, signal transduction. We're talking about you know, transcription factors binding to things. And we're talking about you know, competitive binding, and I mean, there's a lot. Were there. these like intro bio students, or were these more people who have been through biology courses and 
Sorry. You're good. No, no, no. You're fine. I'm going to ask a little question because a lot of these same questions yeah. will come up. So we're yeah. going to move on after this. No, we don't want to cut off discussion, but it's yeah. uh, that's Sorry. great. But no, no, it's fine. Don't worry. I'm talking to you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, the, the students, surprisingly, were not mostly biology students. So the, the majority of the, of the students, I'd say about half, are biochemistry students. So they probably had been through some form of biology. Um, there were actually just chemistry students in there. Um, Zach, do you remember there were some other odd uh, majors? <coughs> yeah, there were some EDB people, I think, as well, and uh, some neuroscience people. Neuro, yeah. And there may even have been physics. Yeah, so it, it was a nice mix of people. Yeah, so maybe half to two thirds of them had had some sort of biology, and the others hadn't. Um, it was interesting to see the chemistry people. Uh, uh, some of them, I should say, were really struggling because they had uh, a scenario in which light was causing a change. It was a circadian rhythm idea. And they couldn't get past the idea that light could be transformed into chemical energy. And they were really stuck on that. You know, and, and they couldn't get even into the genes. You know, and so it was, it was fun. But facilitating that and taking them through that, we could do that on sort of a one-on-one -on -one or one-to-three basis. So, I do just want to add as well that all of the participants have developed a rubric, so a scoring rubric, and so I'm sure they'd be happy to share that with you as well. So in terms of the, the assessment question, there was a, a, a specific rubric developed. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Rafael Palomino, who is a graduate student in chemistry and biochemistry. He's going to tell you about his activity. Okay, so uh, this year my team developed an inquiry activity um, for the WEST program, which is workshops for engineers and science transfers. We had about 24 incoming community college transfers who were mostly biochemistry and biology majors. Um, and most of them, a lot of them I should say, noted they were about ready to take their first biochemistry course. It's kind of a level, and we had about five hours over two days with them. We developed three activities um, centered around protein structure. Uh, one where they were able to look at how a protein's color changed uh, in the presence of different chemicals. One where they used calmodulin mutations to learn something about protein structure and function, and one where they were actually able to design a protein to have a specific function. Uh, but the practice we focused on was generating hypotheses. So to illustrate how this is kind of difficult for some learners, um, I'm just going to look to an activity I did last year with a different team. We had them building small molecule drugs to fit a target. Uh, we weren't thinking about hypothesis generation, but what we thought would happen is that they would observe something about the drug. Uh, they would hypothesize what's going on, they would test that, get feedback, revise from there. What actually happened was they observed something kind of vague, they would ask a question, often it was a yes or no question, they'd get an answer, and if the answer was no, they'd kind of be feeling like they were done. Or sometimes they'd say, if they, you know, if they put some kind of uh, bulky group on a drug and got a response, they would say, let's just keep doing that over and over and see what happens until we break it, right? And so uh, they weren't trying to understand what was going on. So this year with our group, we sat down and tried to think about what are some specific components of generating a hypothesis that we can assess and give them an opportunity to get better at. So one of these was uh, making observations about a system and asking specific questions about the system, uh, because then you use those to develop an initial hypothesis uh, that is testable, because ultimately that is gonna be a springboard for your experiments. And then finally, uh, the important part is being able to take new information as you get it and revise that hypothesis uh, based on that information without feeling stuck and confused or working through that process. And so I'm going to take you quickly to one group that I thought uh, did a really good job with this first. So the first thing we had the students do as a whole was get practice making observations and asking questions by rotating through those three groups that I mentioned and asking questions about what they saw. Then we broke them into smaller groups of three to work uh, on a specific question that they were interested in. This particular group was uh, struck by this calmodulin station. Um, in particular, after talking for a little bit, they were really, uh, they, they came up with a really great specific question as to why a couple of methionine mutations led to disease. Um, the one on the right versus the one on the left, it did not. Uh, it's just specific to the activity, but that was their question. Without even starting to do anything, just looking at these three static images, they actually developed a really nice start to a hypothesis in that, well, maybe one of the mutations disrupts the protein structure. So this was fantastic. So far, they're doing a great job. After about an hour and a half, we had some tools for them to use. And this is what they brought me over to show me. Uh, and they said, OK, well, the, the methionine mutation disrupts the sulfur bond that keeps the coil intact. right? So there are a couple things you know, going with this. One of them, the most striking maybe, is that the amino acids are all based inside. 
but as far as the hypothesis generation standpoint goes, they did a fantastic job getting to that point. So they're an area where the learning content, the protein structure isn't there yet, but they're doing really well with the practice. So we let them run with this a little bit longer. We asked them, how else can you test this? We had some other tools for them to play with. Uh, and they were actually able to build uh, an endocrine <coughs> helix, and they figured out that their hypothesis wasn't compatible with how side chains actually sit on this helix. This kind of threw them at first, um, but they were able to figure out a new hypothesis, and ultimately they got better through the next two days at getting at doing this revision process to the point that they started to feel very comfortable getting new information and revising their hypothesis in, instead of feeling like they didn't do it right the first time. <coughs> So ultimately, they did learn something about you know that one mutation in particular was disrupting a protein-protein interaction. But as far as the practice outcomes are concerned, they did really, really well with these first two right off the bat. And through the two days, they got better at this third one that was initially difficult for them to get new information and sort of think about what's going on there. So then just to talk through some struggles that we saw with this, because there were definitely also struggles, the first being that um, in terms of making observations that some students had a hard time getting the specifics. This was particularly the case in this activity. There's a lot of chemicals to perturb, uh, perturb the protein's color, and sometimes it was tough for students to focus in on one big idea. <laughs> um, and as far as developing that initial hypothesis, a lot of students had trouble doing that as well, and they said, well, let's just test everything here. Let's just do everything, and then, and then we'll go from there. And then as far as the revision process goes, instead of using all of the data they've collected to revise, they would say, well, we made these three changes, something happened, let's just keep doing that and see what happens. Again, this idea, let's just keep doing it until we break it, right? Um, despite that, though, all of the groups made a lot of progress. Depending on their starting point, they made progress in this generating hypotheses separately then from learning about protein structure, which is really interesting. And so just the last thing, just some <laughs> how, you know, implementing this stuff into an active classroom. Uh, so these are things that particularly have been powerful for me. Um, one, this idea of assessing practice separately from the content goal, um, so that you can actually develop a rubric and develop the ways to measure how students do with this, um, and you can do it separately from the content, and that you can break down these practices into some specific skills that they can get better at. Um, scaffolding overlapping practices, meaning that in any given activity, Learners are gonna engage in a lot of practices, but if you want them to focus and get better at one thing in particular, you can make some of those other practices a bit easier so that you make sure that they get to the one, in this case, hypothesis generation, that uh, you wanted them to get to. And finally, um, this is something we hear in the PDP a lot, to give opportunities to practice the practice, right? We can deliberately design activities so that they have an opportunity to actually get better at this and not just let the you know, generate hypothesis be a side effect of what the activity was. So, yeah, you said it, you, you spent about five hours on this I'm, and it was over two days. I'm curious how important the break was so that like they went home and thought about it a little bit and then came back to it. Uh, yeah, that was actually, uh, it's a, it, it means a lot because a lot of them go back and think about this stuff and they came in pretty fresh the next day. Um, I didn't get a sense that anybody went and started looking up stuff on the internet or anything like that. Um, but we definitely, they definitely come in and, especially with the idea of how do you take all this information I got in and revise, that's where I think it was most helpful. I just need to interject with the people who are on the video call, and they would like you to repeat the questions of the oh, audience. Oh, okay, cool. So. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you saw them gain more confidence Yes. If you were to characterize that, does it does it break down into a couple of critical events, or is it more of a very continuous smooth curve, kind of a, the reference to phase transitions, type one versus type two? <laughs> how do you think about this? I mean, is it or just some you know mix of both? So so how how do we observe them getting more confidence? How, what, what, what does that look like? What are their critical events where you can see their confidence kind of begin to skyrocket locally, or is it just kind of slowly practicing? They just kind of get more comfortable, and that's where they end up. Are there certain events that give them more confidence boosts? Or does that sound ludicrous? No, 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 I think it is all depends on the activity because I've probably seen it both ways. In this particular group's case, I think it was a continuous thing, um, and especially in the part that they were struggling with with the revisions because at first, again, getting something that didn't fit the hypothesis kind of threw them, they weren't sure how to do that, but slowly over the course of the activity, they started to gain confidence in terms of, this is okay that this statement was wrong, 
you know, we learned something new, so let's figure out what's going on now. So in this case, it was continuous. Thank you. So for both you and Matt, were the students told explicitly at the beginning what your goals were? So were the students told explicitly what our goals were in terms of? Um, uh, in, in terms of taking observations and questions, developing hypotheses, um, formulating models, making better models, or were they sort of led through the process and learning how to do it, but not? Yeah. Without the quite hearing what the goal was at sure. the beginning. So yeah, no, we didn't, uh, we didn't explicitly state anything that you're going to work on hypothesis generation. We talked about how they were going to try to mirror an authentic research practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of it was guided from our end and giving, again, giving opportunities to work on making observations, giving opportunities to work on uh, revising the hypothesis. So yeah, and, th and then at the end, then we made it clear to them that, look, this is what you worked on, and then try to call out people who had done well with this uh, so that they can actually you know, reflect on that later. Yeah. How would their progress through the process depend on their previous um, backgrounds and knowledge? Um, it's all over the place. Uh, we actually had a math major who had taken general chemistry who worked through this same activity. Um, and that was very cool because he had nothing to go on except he knew how atoms look and he knew some general properties about them and he actually was able to make some uh, really big leaps in it too. So. Um, and then I just quickly on the other end, we had people who knew the word, like they could say alpha helix, but then you asked them to describe the basis for that and they weren't necessarily able to do that. So even when they knew some language, uh, they got a lot out of it in terms of, of you know, what those things actually mean. Did, did the knowledgeable people have to pull along the less knowledgeable or how do you, how do you orchestrate that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that is a whole facilitation um, process that we actually get as PP participants. We learned some steps about, about facilitation. Uh, and things we can do to help along with that. That's a whole whole other discussion, but we can definitely talk about that. More? Yeah. yeah. So, so the first time students would see protein structure, the ECS would be in bio 28. And in that context, this could be incredibly valuable, but, but there's limited time. So the five hours of class time can be devoted to hacking through this, but at the same time, the value in getting students to understand amino acid substitutions for groups, major effects in protein structure is a great take home. Is there a way to, are there parts of this that can be trimmed down to any class activity in a larger class and limited time? Yeah, I think with stuff like this, I mean these inquiry activities are definitely geared to most drop into like a lab type thing, but there are a lot of big ideas that came out of this, namely in misconceptions about protein chemistry. And I think those types of big things that, so, how you're gonna assess this stuff, what you're looking for in learners, and then when you do it, you learn a lot about what actually confuses them and how what misconceptions they have. Really, those things are like the powerful things that then you can figure out a way to do that in an hour, maybe with you know the, the sort of uh, scaffold of you know, uh, cal modular mutations. So yeah, I think with those big ideas, you can definitely transfer it to something in a different setting. Our next speaker is Robin Duncan, and Robin is an instructor here in the EEB, teaches biology, and um, has been in the program a couple of times. Hello, I'm so glad to see so many faces here, many familiar. Um, so, let's see here. Uh, we did an activity, uh, both Tish and I actually did an activity in a venue that was new this year, specifically geared uh, for developing, um, we were all geared toward this, but developing activities for these uh, flip classes that are part of the HHMI program. And, um, and Tisha and I actually pulled students from our current 20B uh, classes, so or 20A and 20B classes. So they were actual introductory science students that went through this program. Um, and it was a you know five, six hour day on top of the greenhouse, uh, both of us so the core practice that we were focused on is another take on looking at models, specifically using evidence to build models while learning about water movement in plants and animals. Okay, so why did we focus on this practice? Because as we know, we all use models as scientists, and I'm sure you've all, in your own work, uh, started doodling pictures of, of some phenomena, trying to understand it better. And so we were trying to really target that practice where you are thinking about something and you're trying to actually uh, make sense of it by drawing a, a, a 
not a model, a picture model on the paper. Why do we do this? Because as we all know, this is how students feel about models. So you use the word model and the eyes glaze over and they think I have to do a bunch of math and, and that's their only understanding of models. We are trying to break that down a little bit, that barrier, and show them all of the different ways that we use models. So just to kind of walk you through the, the entire day that we did, or our, our inquiry activity, what we did, we started off by having students observe three different phenomena, which all rely on this idea that animals and plants actually actively use, or actively move salt, meaning they use energy to move salt, as a mechanism to move water around their bodies. So the kidney, self-explanatory, we, we all have some familiar, familiarity with that. Um, the opening and closing of guard cells in plants is another example. And then the salt gland in uh, the noses of marine iguanas is a third. So they watched a, a short video about these phenomena, and then they were able to choose which of them they wanted to further investigate. They were then given um, evidence statements, which were curated from scientific literature. And what I mean by curated is that we went through and selected evidence that we felt was at the appropriate level that, and was enough of evidence to actually get them to a model where they could explain these phenomena at the level appropriate for bio 20B or 20A. To give you an example of what these evidence statements look like for the guard cell uh, phenomena, uh, it fully opens demata guard cells, the potassium concentration is several fold higher in plant guard cells and its surrounding tissue. There's a strong positive correlation between potassium in the guard cell and the amount that the aperture is open between the guard cells. Um, and these were all cited, so there was a, a you know an air to understanding the, the uh, that this came from primary literature. Um, we gave them the prompt that they were to come up with an explanation supported by evidence for the movement of water and salts in the system and state how the evidence supports their explanation compared to other possible explanations. And then at the end of our activity, they presented their model to peers. We had a jigsaw exchange so they could see how other groups um, came up with a model to explain similar phenomena. Okay, so what did this uh, kind of look like? First off, um, the specific aspects of this practice of using evidence to build models, to kind of zoom in a little bit more on that practice. Uh, if they're proficient at it, they should be able to build a model that represents the complete phenomena, right? The complete picture of what's going on. All parts of the model are supported by evidence. So you've probably seen student papers where you have random arrows going off here and you're like, what does this mean, right? And there's random boxes drawn. So we were looking for students to actually draw a model where everything had meaning. Um, and then a third step was that they were actually able to modify their model to incorporate new evidence, or they could use the model that they built to adequately, adequately explain new evidence that they were given. Um, a little bit more about what this actually looked like. So again, every element of the drawing had a purpose. Uh, also, we, we were particularly interested that they were supporting their model with evidence. So each part of the model, we asked them to cite one of the evidence statements that we gave them. And then again, they can alter their model or they can use it to explain new evidence. So what did students struggle with in this? Um, one of the struggles that a lot of groups have had was kind of getting lost in the evidence a little bit and uh, forgetting the big picture that they were trying to explain this phenomenon. And you would see groups kind of wander into the weeds and then come back and wander into the weeds and come back, which I think actually was a, a very valuable part of the experiment our experience because we all feel that way when doing science, right? We, <laughs> other grad students are all going, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so we wander into the weeds, we, we remind ourselves, oh yeah, and we come back to it, and that's actually a really authentic experience. Um, when they had conflicting evidence, or what they perceived to be conflicting evidence, how do you grapple with that? Uh, that was a, a, a valuable um, experience that they had. The other thing I think that was, um, was a little bit challenging as facilitators was that some students um, lack some basic knowledge that they needed to actually really start to get into a place where they could really build a model for the phenomena that we were looking at. So one group in particular just, you know, they did not have a full grasp of, of membrane structure and that, you know, they were working on the kidney and that things were going to have to go in one side of a cell and out the other side. And so that limited their ability to actually get as far as other groups did. 
and vocabulary and jargon is also a barrier, I think, to a lot of students. And so, uh, one I'll skip the recommendation here is one recommendation for next time would be to kind of remove that barrier by providing some vocabulary lists. Um, that recognizing that we have a lot of second language learners and some of that jargon and vocabulary can be pretty tough. Other recommendations, um, you know, this activity obviously took five hours, but um, I was just actually talking about this with Susie, our, our, one of our HHMI postdocs today, and we're gonna try to use some of what we learned here to move it into the bigger classes as well as into our active learning class in the spring. So any activity in which they have to actually translate an evidence statement into some kind of drawing um, is, is a hugely helpful skill that they don't get to practice very often. So that can be a five minute activity in a class where you give them an evidence statement and then you ask them to draw what they think that means. Um, providing multiple pieces of, of evidence and then letting them grapple. That is such an authentic experience. And feedback that we had from students and some of the teaching reports was that they felt like they were doing science and so that was actually a very high compliment because that was the point right um, uh, so if you have a group that's struggling or you have a student that's struggling um, asking them to state the evidence in plain language and, and any student that's been in my class will know that I say this all the time state it in plain language how would you explain it to your mom right I mean this is the kind of thing that you can actually practice practically tell a student that gets them to the point where they can actually translate science into, into you know, something they understand. Um, <clears throat> encouraging students to start with one piece of evidence, so getting at the problem where they're feeling overwhelmed by all of this, uh, this evidence, if they start with one piece, make the drawing. Look at the next piece, modify it. So really spelling out that that's how we do it. It's an iterative process. And then finally, um, as more of a facilitation type uh, suggestion, as we're walking around to groups, constantly asking them to explain why they're making a choice. It's very easy for students to, I think, um, Raphael, you mentioned this too, just kind of keep keep going because something they got a they got some kind of a um, feedback. But really getting them up front with why are you doing something? I think that's a really key thing to do in any. Um, so since you teach bio the intro bio series yeah. if you were to translate this into a larger class uh -huh. with all intro students would you do this for every idea that you needed to present? Would you do all of your instruction based on an inquiry model, or um, would you I, mix it up with other active learning techniques? Yeah, so so absolutely mixing it up is really important, and, and Susie is, is our HHMI postdoc, and we've been working closely on that, and even in the existing classes, right, um, we try and pull from this really broad repertoire of different activities that have been designed already by others, and that is being designed here by, by IC and PDP, and so, um, you know, students will get bored just like anybody else, and, and, and one person might learn better using one activity than another. And so, uh, you know, I can see actually taking some of the ideas that we've done with, with just this activity today and actually using it in different ways in different classes. Um, so I definitely think variety is, is a really important aspect of it. Yeah? Sorry. Okay. So if you were to put this into like a bio 20 or A uh -huh. or B class, how many active learning activities what do you think you would do like in a quarter okay so so for the current way like with you know when I have 400 students um, oh, yeah, yeah so there's kind of like two like ways that we're doing it right <laughs> so when I in my 400 student class you know every class period I try to do something where we are where I am not talking so we do graphs we do some kind of a worksheet we do pair shares where they're having to discuss something um, and we may do multiple of those in a class period for the flipped class that we're going to be doing in the spring, it's going to be that on steroids, right? We're going to do that and we're going to absolutely, you know, very minimal lecture and we're going to design activities for every big idea that's going to be in the class. And then that will be supported through um, some online lecture, some video, um, some short lecture in class, 
of a, a number of different ways that we can actually support the students as they kind of take a more learner-centered uh, approach in the class. So, so is it all question? inquiry based? Were they so, it, so, is so one thing like, is that there's, there's some information here. Yeah, you know, so we use this term active learning yeah. to incorporate also inquiry, and inquiry is a very specific way okay. of, of doing this that has a whole bunch of different components that you've seen part of that here. Um, but active learning can be anything from these pair shared kind of things um, to an inquiry activity. Okay. So, yeah, so it, it's going to, that's more of an inclusive term, I would say. Yeah. So, this is also for Raphael. Um, when you, <coughs> you you give them some evidence statement and you mm -hmm. statements and you give them this this challenge, and then um, but then maybe they don't feel like they have enough knowledge. Is there a point at which they have to go back and kind of s study the basics? As do you have a, another set of information? Yeah, behind so it that's ready for them to. That's look a really at? good question, and and it's something that we learned out of doing this the first time is that. I'm really glad at the last minute we made the decision to give them a cheat sheet that had a whole bunch of different transporters on it because it reminded them, oh yeah, you know, there's these things right. that are called co-transporters and I forgot about that from 28. Right, and right. so that was a, a kind of a scaffold to help them. Right. Um, but if once we are, if we're going to incorporate this in, the, in some version into the, into the spring class, um, I think that it will be important to have a primer of some kind before we actually launch them into this. Yeah. And you know, we may not do this activity with these topics, right? Uh, Susie and I were just discussing how this actually could really work well for, um, I think we said, uh, uh, the, kidney oh, the kidney, right. Kidney, uh, right, teaching the kidney is really, really hard and this might actually be a really good activity to, to get to that. How, how do they feel, Raphael, when you let them go all the way down to some crazy solution that's <laughs> then violated completely by the fundamentals that they suddenly learned later? Is, yeah, do, mean, they, do they get mad at you? Or? No, <laughs> no, I think it actually ends up being a really cool experience for them. And But we definitely have to think about how far we want them to go. We always right, right. talk about how, how far do we want them to deviate before we need to reel them back in versus, no, this is still a good opportunity. Right. Let's let them go. Right. And one skill that PDP is really good at teaching is that facilitation decision and giving them opportunities to get themselves back before you just. And I have another question, which is, where's my pad with the emails? Is it making its way around? Did yeah, it stall? It's, it's, it's all. Has everyone gotten it? Yeah. It, I don't no, think this side of the room. It didn't come through here. So. Okay. okay sorry. One more question. Technical and then we'll question. Go to the last speaker. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so I. Did I no. No. Yeah. Um, so I love what you said about allowing them to grapple with it, and that that made them feel like they were doing something. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed is that when we do science, we don't know what the answer is. But students get fixated on getting the right answer. And yeah. I wonder what, I mean, this is to all of you, what you did, how you handled that. Yeah, that was actually something I would improve on next time. Because obviously the phenomena that we pick, there are outstanding models in papers that we pulled from. And so there's, it's, it's not solved, but it's certainly solved more than what they were going to get to. And, and Students did one of their feedback. One of the feedback that we got from them was that they wanted to know what the real model was. <laughs> so, so, and I get that, right? I mean, we all have that desire to know what is the right answer. Um, and so, I think that when we do this activity again, we would really think carefully about how to incorporate that into a wrap up at the end of the class, um, making really making sure to be really careful about. Um, recognizing how far they got. We didn't expect that they would get to a model that's in a published paper. We didn't give them enough evidence to get there. We were thinking more along the lines of getting to the model that's presented in an introductory bio textbook. Um, and so kind of making sure that they understand that it's important. I okay. guess you'll know it's working when you show a model and talk about it and they ask you, what does that arrow mean? Yes, yes. that kind of question is perfect. <laughs> I never get that kind Thank of question. <laughs> personally because she has done, been doing so much for the HHMI project and getting the transparent courses off the ground. She really jumped onto the team and yeah. doing a lot. And then our next speaker is Tisha Bohr, and she's in the she's a graduate student in MCD. And also, just while I'm saying thank you, I want to thank Tisha because she really helped to get this um, off the ground. She did the website, worked a lot with Ian Marcus as well, but it's really wonderful that you sort of took this on and said, let's make this happen. Okay, then I'm going to let you take over and tell us about your activity. Thanks, Linda. And I'm sorry for cutting people off earlier, but we're almost getting to the hour, and I don't want people to be stir crazy. So, 
Um, so I'm going to tell you about um, how we uh, did an activity where we got students to explain results using models of mitosis. Okay, and so I'll just give you a brief background on what we did um, in our inquiry, and we presented students with these um, images of these things called karyotypes, which is just a chromosome spread, and most um, people have two of each chromosome, but they would have um, these karyotypes of people with extra chromosomes or missing chromosomes, and this is a, a particular one of someone with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. And then we, we had them generate questions around how did this error occur, and it can only, it can only occur in meiosis. So we then had them um, build a model of meiosis correctly um, using knowledge and a variety of tools around the room, um, mostly images or puzzles of the different events that they weren't getting it. Then they were able to build these models and then use the model to figure out where um, the error occurred during meiosis. And the practice that we focused on was explaining results. Um, and the importance of this practice is, is, is pretty big. Um, you have to be able to explain your results in order to make predictions based on any of the previous research out there. So if you see a result out there, then you have to take in, you know, that those results, make predictions to develop your hypotheses, and then you have to test those hypotheses, get results from those, and then use those results to construct arguments to support whatever claims you've made based on your experiments. And that's also very key to communicating science to other people and the general public. Um, and just in general explaining uh, the natural phenomenon that we're all so, so interested in understanding. And so we focus on three key parts of explaining results. The first is making a claim. So the students would make a statement or conclusion that explains the result. So this, hap this error happens here. Um, using evidence, um, so then they use scientific data to support that claim that they made. And that data has to be appropriate and sufficient to make the claim. So they can say it's, they can use some evidence, but it might not be right. Um, and then they have to justify that, that evidence and claim link um, and show their reasoning behind why they think that evidence supports the claim that they've made. Okay, so to do this, um, we facilitated them in building a model of meiosis. So their model was their initial claim. They made a model, was it right or not? We would ask them, does your model support what we know about meiosis and what you know about meiosis? Um, and that was using evidence, okay? And so if their model wasn't, if they couldn't make the evidence to support their claim, then they'd have to go back and revise the model. But if they could, then it would be like, okay, so, so how does that support? Like, how does that evidence support that your model is correct? And if they could then do that, that was their justification. We then asked them to use their model um, to figure out where the error occurred in um, their karyotype. And so this was just another reinforcement um, of actually practicing that, um, going back to your model, using your, using your result, making a claim, um, and, then, and then reasoning through it. And so they would state where the error occurred in meiosis, um, and then we'd ask them why, and they'd have to use the model to show us why they thought it happened there and then explain um, why it happened there. Um, and so they didn't have to go through that, that experience. Um, and this was mostly done doing verbal cues. So we would ask them these specific questions while we we're going through the activity. But we also had a prompt um, at the end, it was a written prompt they had to make a poster on, um, that asked for these very specific things for them to then present to the class. So they actually had to do this again in a very formal way that we could actually assess. And we had a rubric that had um, what it would look like when they um, mastered these skills and what it would look like when they did it. <coughs> okay, and so what did they struggle with when um, they went through these processes? Most students could make some sort of model um, or a claim about where their error occurred. But when it came to um, explaining why they thought it was that way, like why, is, why do you think your model, why do you think these chromosomes segregate at this time? Um, they were, have a really hard time going back to like 
you know, the parents or the offspring and tying in how those fit together. Um, and if they did get to the point where they could um, use evidence to support their claim, they really did have a hard time um, reasoning through that. Um, again, they would just say, okay, because of this, that happens, but why? And then we really have to kind of facilitate that. Um, one thing that we didn't really take into consideration when we uh, piloted this activity was um, considering alternative explanations. So the error could occur in one part of meiosis um, or another part, possibly. And so they make a claim that it occurred in this part of meiosis, but then when we ask them if it could occur somewhere else, they'd be like, well, but, that, but it occurs here. So like coming up with alternate ex explanations, maybe it didn't even happen in meiosis, who knows. Um, that was really hard for, for them. Okay, so recommendations of um, implement these, implementing this into a classroom, I would say um, when you're trying to um, teach a practice, try to couple it with content that is appropriate to, for students to be able to engage in that practice. Um, sometimes your inquiry or your activity dictates what practice you do, and then sometimes your practice will go back and dictate how your activity runs. So it's kind of a random process if you're trying to teach content and an activity, they really have to tie in together, and you have to work with both of them to get them to match pretty well. And so that's something that can take some time. Um, and then you also <coughs> want to take into consideration what, the, what students struggle with most in these practices and try to develop a scaffolding that will help them with those specific aspects. So that they're just not like trying to figure this stuff out but have no idea what you want them to do or how they're trying to get there. Um, and then you want to ask the specific questions to elicit out of the students the evidence for their claim and reasoning to connect the two during the activity with any prompts. So you want to make sure your prompts um, and your learning outcomes are developed very clearly so that you know what to ask these students because otherwise you're going to ask them big questions and they're not going to get to where you want them to be. Um, and then future instructors might want to consider providing more support for students evaluating multiple explanations, which we didn't do. Um, for in this case, chromosome number abnormalities. And then briefly, I'm going to go through a thank you slide. This is for all of us. Um, and so I want to take, thank the HHMI Active Learning Team um, who really helped these activities come together and helped the seminar happen. Um, the ICE team also, um, obviously these inquiries would not even be possible without them. They're a huge resource on campus and I think anyone that's interested in teaching should um, look into participating with them. Um, I want to thank our 2015 H1PP teams. All of these people had huge contributions to the activities that we just talked about. So we were the leaders, but all of us equally contributed to the development of these um, activities. And then uh, Jim Belzey, who's the team in the greenhouse guy, he let us do our stuff up there, it was great. Matt's um, project was in the Mark MBSR Summer Research Institute. And then finally, I want to thank the PBSI faculty, our PIs who've supported us and allowed us to do these things. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of time to run these programs, and they let us do it. Um, John Tankin, who's been, uh, who I've actually taught this activity with in the intro bio, bio class with Ian, and um, Susan uh, Strom and Rowe, who um, have been very, very supportive of graduate students at MCD participating in this program. So, all right, thanks. like the second part of the activity, them being able to explain the error depends on them getting the correct model of meiosis. And so we did facilitate them a lot in getting that model. So we, we offered them a lot of support in getting that model solid before they could go on to explain the error. Um, so yes, they absolutely had to get the correct model before they could move on, and they all did. Okay, this is a question for Lisa, but is there support to some of these exercises and try to bring them to 
are huge classes. Like I teach cell biology to 300. Yeah, and that's what we're hoping. A lot of this come. It starts to trigger this. So sort. how do we, how do we get access to I don't know these PowerPoint presentations or, or something? Yeah. So we'd be happy to we could post these up on the website where we have post, posted this, and I think we could also. I mean, they've, done, they've done some pretty small snippets from their activities, and they have a lot more things in there, so we can think about how can we... Yeah, so how do we yeah. mine that information right. and use in our class? Right. Yeah, we're still working through that a little bit, and how yeah, how do we, because we have a lot of information, we have pretty extensive lesson plans, whether we, or, we could potentially organize something like that, and maybe it's topically by content or by some of these practices, and in some cases, maybe even directly linking you back to some people that you could just work with directly. Would it be helpful to see the lesson plans or is it too many of them in two different areas? They're pretty, they're pretty big <laughs> because they have a lot of rationale behind them but I think we could start to mine them though. I think that, archiving them by yeah. topics might be. By topics? By topic? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's how we kind of uh, go through the right. syllabus. No, these and are really good ideas. We can different features of the, you know, like sub, sub topics. Of okay. Yeah. So we're, yeah. and this is right, That's we're just starting, so we're this, definitely wanting no, to get this kind of, here for yeah. yeah. I mean, the yeah. Grant. But this is the key, right, because yeah. in the end, we're not going to be teaching small classes mm -hmm. that use the ESC yeah. that many, right? Yeah. right? We're, we're kind of stuck with the model of these large classes. Are yeah. we? I, I'm not ready to capitulate what? on that yet. Yeah, yeah. well, no. I, But yeah. I'm crazy, too. So. so one thing, there are online other resources. There's actually an online journal of, right. of lesson plans for getting topics. And, group, group. and there's course source. And yeah. There's, yeah, so there's, 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 there's things things outside of UCSC. If there's like one thing you're really interested in, you can dig in and <coughs> find models of these sort of activities. But I do, I think it's a really good question because that's what we want is how do we get some of this out to other people. I mean, so what I would say in too a useful is way that, you know, if you have, you have a course like that, just start eroding your, your lectures and putting one or two of these to start with. Yeah, trying absolutely. It and just also see, where to find one but also right. see, yeah. see, right. the, see one of your grad students to work on a topic. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, have them, have them. Yeah, only if they're interested in teaching, which I don't have to do. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, let's see, the other point is, is communication across the um, classes, because if you guys take over some of these in the 20, the intro series, then I don't well, it would have to be level appropriate. You could use something similar, but it would just have to be jacked up to yeah. your level of class. But yeah, you could you could do that. The other um, so because the same problems will be there. That's right. true. <laughs> yeah. So the discussion is about for the computer people uh, is about how are we going to actually implement these in the classrooms? And I think um, if you're if you're really wanting someone to design something for you. Um, get in contact. We have every year these activities get designed through the PDP. You could get in contact with any of the team leads or or anything like that if you wanted a specific content to be worked on. And I'm sure one of us leads would be happy to take that on. And the website will say how we find these people. Oh uh, yeah, I can add that to the website. Absolutely. Sort of a road and also the IC website yeah. already. Yeah, the IC website has all the teams yeah. on no. there. No, this is a great discussion. This is just what we hope yeah. to come out of this. Is how do we? Yeah, how do we go about change? Like there's like the whole activity, small activities, components, and I think everybody's brought up even some small, like five minute things. And so, so I, I had a question. I kind of built on Mimi's question uh -huh. in the last after the last talk about priming them with the right information. I was yeah. wondering if any of the speakers see a role for textbooks anymore, or should we not be assigning those? Or, no, we I, I can speak to that, actually. We just were talking about this in a, in a meeting, and, and I feel strongly, and others do as well, that um, especially in if you're going to do this flip class, which we're going to do, the textbook is an anchor. And you throw a bunch of people into this active learning situation, they feel uncomfortable. You know, it is uncomfortable. It's something they haven't experienced before. Um, and and I feel pretty strongly that a textbook can provide a resource for them that, that at least they're familiar with. And, and I, so I think textbooks, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think textbooks are actually so really would you helpful. Assign yeah. That yeah, to the you can assign, assign, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's a really helpful thing. Does reading about it undermine their inquiry? 
So I actually just taught an active learning class. It was small. It was just summer session, um, but it was fully active learning. Um, and the students used um, just, it wasn't a textbook. It was a primer for ecology, which is a small <coughs> book that we use in ecology. And the students actually said, I've never used a textbook more in my entire life. Like, because they actually, like you're saying, use it more as an anchor. And they're using it as like, OK, so I want to move forward, but what do I know? And constantly going back. The expectation is on them more than it is in a lecture class, right? The yeah. expectation to figure it out is on them. And so well, it has to, you're making them use the information that's in the textbook instead yeah. of yeah. Before, I, I don't want to cut off the conversation. Yeah. I just want to say two things. Next uh, talk is by Charlie McDowell. That's going to be November 12th here in the same room. And there are two slots still open, right? April and June. So if you want to talk or you know somebody who wants to talk in this series, uh, Tisha or yeah, or me, we'll get them going. So Susan that's it. OK. Had, Susan had one a question. Yeah. She's had her hand open. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Maybe, maybe we'll close out on this. So this clearly um, depends on effective group work. And I wondered if the PDP has specific strategies for involving shy students, students who feel weak, <laughs> over overbearing students, students who don't want to work in groups. You know, there are all ways, all kinds of ways that students will not participate effectively in a group. And we were taught some of the strategies in the summer thing, but I wondered if PDP says, okay, here, here are things we can do. So the question is about uh, how to get people to work in groups. Yeah. Um, I have something to say. Um, we do. Well, I just add that I see does do a training on that, yeah. and I think it's one that could actually be really transferable in a way that goes. That would be great. We so yeah. we could find that on the IC site. It's yeah, not, I would not. I'm. It's not there yet. Yeah. But we can start <laughs> building these. Things. Why not do one of these seminars on that? I would yeah. love to have. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. yeah. yeah. We can do that. Okay. Before, before people leave, I just want to say too. I want to echo what Manny said because I I feel like we we started this community. I hope that this becomes a place where people can share what's working, what's not, and it's just a place where there's so many people that are doing great work on campus. And we really hope that people come and share what they're doing, share what their struggles are. I appreciate it. All the speakers also talked about things that didn't work so well or that they wish they would have done. And I, I hope that this becomes this kind of a, a place where we can all talk about teaching together. And then we can continue, but I just want to make sure people, because I'm sure people have things to go, right? An on site question is, were you done by a single facilitator with all of my 